Hi, I'm Rebecca Lennon. I'm an artist originally from Stockport, Manchester, and I've been living in London for 13 years. I graduated from the Slade MFA programme in 2010 and often work as a visiting lecturer across universities such as Arts University Bournemouth and Royal College of Art London. I exhibit and perform internationally in both art and experimental music contexts and I've taken part in residencies, film festivals, radio projects, sonic releases and publications. My practice is thematically obsessive but formally varied. I work across media including large-scale multi-channel sound and video installations, musical releases, performances and writing as well as visual scores, drawings and textile pieces. So I'm going to start with an extract from a piece that I produced recently called Mouths, a work that was developed cumulatively through performances at TACO, a project space in Thamesmead in 2019, and at practice at David Dale Gallery, Glasgow this year. Mouths has just been released on artist Benedict Drew's label, Thanet Tape Centre, and was recently in an exhibition in Braga, Portugal called Blistering Tongues. everywhere. The waste disposal workers are throwing it in the streets in protest. Da, 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 da. It's blowing into your house, making everything smell of uncooked meat wrappers. Da, 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 da. A plant is cut and leaks white liquid. A cactus spills out of itself 
leaving only skin. Da, 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 da. Full fat cow's milk fills us up, moving around by our collective inside. Da, 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 da. There's fly tip rubbish everywhere. The waste disposal workers are throwing it in the streets in protest. The dis acts on the order, becoming intrusive. The dis is a sine wave, a repeated curve of central conflict, a rhythm of spillage and control, inflate and deflate, a repeated curve of central conflict, 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 a repeated curve of central conflict. A repeated curve of central conflict. My work uses rhythm and musicality within video and sound editing to disturb narrative flow, evoking a psychological and neurodivergent relationship to language, words, loops and noise that meditates on memory and its voices. In this piece I performed behind a red perspex screen held precariously with bricks. In performances I often use props that partially obscure myself and other performers within the work as a method of producing distance. I'm also interested in exploring ways to suggest performer as image or object of dissociating voice from mouth or confusing that which is live and that which is recorded. This performance event at David Dell Gallery was based around the idea of rehearsal as form which suits my work as rather than producing discrete finished works, I like to think of my works as rehearsals, sketches or iterations that take different forms. I want to create a relationship between my writing and the ideas contained within it and my methods of sound recording. For example, here in Mouths, I recorded the voice both as it moves through the air externally and also internally using contact mics on the throat to record the sound of the voice as it moves through the larynx before it's shaped by the mouth. The mumbling texture of the voice at the end sounds almost as if it's trapped before becoming clear again, and this echoes the movement between inside and outside narrated within the text. For example, meat wrappers blowing into the house from the waste disposal van and milk moving through bodies. Going back to a work produced in 2018, Words Are Angular Sharp Tenant was a video and sonic exhibition commissioned by Matt's Gallery London. This was one of the first works where I started really taking seriously my work with sound. Words are angular sharp. Tenant. Words are angular sharp. Tenant. Words are angular sharp. Words are angular sharp. Words are angular sharp. Tenant. Words are angular sharp. Tenant. Words are angular sharp. Words are angular sharp. Words are angular sharp. Words are angular sharp. Tenant. 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 I, no head. I, no body. I, getting rid of an I. I, taking on another. I, I, I.
when I was young, maybe even ten, a group of teenagers punched me in a circle. I remember being impressed by the cleanness of the act, how visual it was, how choreographed it was, as they swung at me one by one until the whole circle released. Words are angular sharp. Tenant. Method actors get rid of themselves through sudden, uncontrolled movements. I. 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 Choreography. Sharp order choreography. A year ago, the roof of my mouth collapsed. Flesh fell off in chunks and I swallowed it. Now there's just a hole. Choreography. Sharp order choreography. Hi. Words are angular sharp. Tenon. Words are angular sharp. Tenon. I. Pigeon wings. No body. On a beach in Blackpool. I. Headless angel statue in a cemetery praying. I. St. Francis talking to the birds in their own language. Words are angular sharp. Tenant. Words are angular sharp. Tenant. Words are angular sharp. Some, Some children are shooting passers by with a water gun outside the last house left on a derelict street. I. 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 You. In an experiment, a pigeon was placed between two windows, one full of food and the other empty. The pigeon quickly learned to find food, but occasionally, according to regular cycles, they check to see if by any chance there is not some food behind the empty window. I, you. The experiment was repeated with humans with the same results. It was in this work that I initially started working with vocal percussion for example, coughs, ticks, and vocal sounds. As when I was recording my voice reading texts, I realized that there were all these sounds that I was initially editing out that were a massive part of the way that I think and process the world. So instead of editing them out, I started using them to structure the edits. Instead of decentering them, I began centering them. Vocal percussion gives the work a musicality that also feels quite psychological an interior made exterior, again, a boundary breakdown. It's as if they are rhythms played by the mind. In this video and others, meaning is stabilized as the relationship between things constantly shift and signification breaks down. Writing is based on interconnected images, descriptions of events, flows and actions that echo each other but keep changing form. An acupuncture needle breaks the skin, producing silence. Here, the bodily gesture of crossed fingers connects to this image of knotted barbed wire. There are reoccurring themes in my work. Passively violent structures erected to protect territories, structures that contain or choreograph bodies, boundaries, knots, the figures of the landlord and tenant appear in this work and others as metaphors for different kinds of ownership and containment. Here liquid comes out of the mouth instead of a voice, while another voice speaks over it as if ventriloquized. Another image shows derelict terrace houses and tells a story of a child from the last house left on a derelict street, shooting passers by with a water gun. This narrative, which did actually happen to me and comes back into my work in the Not Commons, speaks of a silent agency. The child makes a loaded symbolic gesture while his home and community is being taken away.
Again, referencing dereliction. This is a fragment of text from my recent work. It describes tiles that are taken from the roofs of houses to allow water to seep in and forcing dereliction. In 2019, I was awarded the DYCP Arts Council Award to develop my work with sound and specifically multi-speaker sonic compositions. In previous works, such as Words Are Angular Sharp Tenant, I was working with layering voices in stereo to create a sense of vocal plurality. And from this, I started to experiment with how voices can be spatialized to get closer to the way that we inhabit voices polyvocally. Through this award, I was able to test my ideas, producing a six speaker polyvocal performance featuring myself and two other artists, Carl Gent and Stella Kajombo at Kunstraum in London. The performance was called Eating the Wallpaper Collapses the Sharp Lines. So I'm going to show an extract of this video. Or an extract of the performance. This is mine, this is yours, 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 this is mine, this is yours
in solvent loses its form in liquid, dissolving, fizzing up like vitamin C, and becoming it. Becoming liquid is the opposite of having a voice. Eyes parallel with the spine. The animal spits out its no voice liquid on loop like a drinking fountain. But liquid cannot pay what's due. Liquid cannot pay what's due. So I'm just showing an extract of that work because the text reoccurs in, in the Not Commons. Speakers were arranged in a circle outside the audience who were invited to sit in the middle. Voices were spatialised as the performers stood outside the circle, while live and pre-recorded voices moved around the space giving a sense of vocal dissociation. For example, at one point Stella's voice is coming out of the speakers but she is silent and inanimate and at another Carl is saying one thing while their pre-recorded voice says something else coming from another speaker seemingly detached from them. Performers wore black velour hooded tracksuits while the audience were lit by coloured lights moving from green to red to blue in accord with shifts in the text. Using colour to choreograph tone and mood is something that I have done throughout my practice. Vocal sounds such as ticks and hums build up, while a spoken text describes the movement of liquid to liquidation through a hole in the roof, the thirst of vampires and the extraction and dereliction enacted by mosquitoes. Screens fed the text to performers while they stood inanimate, suggesting them as receivers or occupants of the voice and text. So it was from this initial experiment with spatial sound that I developed Liquid Eye, the Not Commons. Liquid Eye was a six-speaker sound and three-channel synchronised video installation that took place at Primary, Nottingham, a primary school turned art gallery. In this work, I was interested again in moving between sounds that feel like an internal psychological noise and something external that punctuates and disturbs that noise, for example, a clap or a cough. I see vocal percussion as a form of sensory self-ordering, which then extends into my work. Non-human subjectivity is also a reoccurring concern within my practice and specifically how language operates as a mastery of the non-human and in this piece that's quite prominent. So I'm going to play this piece but bear in mind that this is just a three channel um, edit of it and um, the piece is meant to be seen as, a, as an installation.
The first fish to be put here was named. She was slippery, hard to catch. But they all came here to find her even so, relishing the challenge. The first to catch her got to give her the name that would define her narrative. But each after that also had their special moment. There's a fantasy of taking a fish out of her element and holding her there. Recording her spitting out her element for the camera and then releasing her. There's a fantasy of putting her here in these waters before taking a fish out of her element. Photographing her spitting it out for the camera with the one who managed to catch her here in this place that she's been put. There's a fantasy of naming the fish that are put here to be pulled out again and again for the camera until a narrative builds. Mm. <clears throat> There's a fantasy of trauma. The smaller you are, the less you're affected. The smallness scale is variable though, and not always decided by size but by other factors. A fish's smallness is that she only breathes underwater mm. and her speech is indecipherable. why her naming ceremony is so important to them. Mm. The fish is always plural. Mm. The naming ceremony only lasts minutes. I. But it feels like it lasts for hours. I. She, she was, was called, called Dyson. Dyson. Mm. She was called Dyson. Mm. She was called Dyson. 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 I. 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 The thirst of the vampire is similar to depression. The thirsty have no energy, cannot wait with the light, and feel a sense of lack. The thirsty feed off those with an excess to alleviate their lack, but liquid cannot pay what's due. Mm. The liquid individual is indecipherable to itself, intolerable to itself, poisoned. There were those that lived on me, as they were building their narrative, attracted to those susceptible to inhabitation by another, and those whose boundaries are roughly drawn. I was ventriloquized. An involuntary host of that blight like the mice that are pushed into cats' mouths by bacteria in search of better housing conditions. Better housing conditions. The thirst to the vampire is similar to depression. She was called Dyson. She was called Dyson. 
The starting point for this work was an interest in carp fishing as a practice. I interviewed a person involved in carp fishing in Nottingham who described the act of capturing the fish as a landscape photography practice. It's integral to carp fishing that the moment that the carp is caught is recorded and shared with the community, he told me. It occurred to me that fish could be seen to symbolise collectivity, hence the words plurality, and this act of bringing the fish out of the water for the camera could be seen as an act of making the fish individual and singular through a human ritual. Carp fish are not wild. The fish are bred, placed, caught, photographed, named and narrativized. She's taken out of the water and held by her captor in his arms. They are photographed together in a staged intimacy and this is circulated through the angling community. Through this and successive captures, a narrative builds around her. She's a fighter, she's heavy, she hides. She resists but in the end she is caught. She is graded on her weight. The fish in my film is named Dyson, which is an actual carp fish known for her size, weight and difficulty to capture. Accordingly, she carries a name synonymous with global branding. The stories told about Dyson develop as she is caught again and again, and the photographs that circulate as trophies of her capture. Anglers line up to bring her out of the water 30 to 60 times per year. In this film, I was particularly interested in the moment the carp is taken out of the lake, spitting out water, spitting out that which she is removed from, the element of her existence that separates her from us, the element that she is desired for. Other entangled imagery in this video show flats being built outside my house and mosquitoes drinking and spitting out blood in rhythmical drips, which I filmed at Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Carl Gent, who is in a lot of my recent work, performs as a human fountain, the water coming from Carl's mouth echoing the spitting of the carp fish and the water seeping in through the roof tiles described earlier. Again, ideas echo each other and take different forms. Primary commissioned artist Sophie Young to write a text response to this work which is a really beautiful text that you can get on the primary website. The second work in this series is called The Not Commons. This took place last month at Dilston Gallery, a repurposed and deconsecrated modernist church in Southwark as a collaboration between Southwark Park Galleries and Matt's Gallery. This three-channel video and spatial sound installation and performance was supposed to take place in 2020, but was postponed due to COVID. The piece features artists Shockley Tan, Carl Gent, Stella Kajombo and Jennifer Hodgson, both as live performers and characters in the video. I also filmed aerialist Mim Wheeler and worked with animator Carla McKinnon. Both Liquid Eye and The Not Commons took place in buildings that previously had a different public function, both of which choreograph and organise bodies and behaviour, and both were turned into art galleries, another place that choreographs and organises bodies and behaviour. The title The Not Commons suggests an entanglement of public and private. The synchronisation of the three screens draws from this choreography and creates another tightly synchronised one. The aerialist's body loops. Mouths spit water and mouths speak or are spoken through via multiple voices. Japanese knotweed moves into a house splitting the pipes and spilling liquid body out of the drains and down the street. 
Mosquitoes again spit blood to the rhythm of vocal sounds and ticks. Macro images of the different performers, eyes, mouths, hands, fill the large screens, connecting different bodies. There was a one day performance on the last day of the exhibition where the performers, again wearing black hooded velour, made vocal sounds and read fragments of the text live, again creating a sense of confusion between that which was live and that which was pre-recorded. The black hooded tracksuits in this and previous works adds to this sense of ritual, but also became another method of creating distance between audience and performer. Five performers were in different locations in the room, the balcony, the stage, near the door, and each were performing different shifts throughout the day. Sometimes there was just one performer, and then sometimes four or five. Each performer had a different script, so that depending on when you entered the gallery, you would experience something completely different. For this show, it was artist Rebecca Jago who wrote a piece of writing in response to this work. And again, this is a really beautiful text called Hollow Architectures. So I'm going to play the Not Commons, but again, as it's meant to be an installation, uh, it, it's experienced quite differently as a single screen video piece. So just bear, bear that in mind when you watch it. This is mine, this is yours, 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 this is
The thirsty feed off those with an excess to alleviate their lack, but liquid cannot pay what's due. Mm. The liquid cannot pay what's due. The liquid cannot pay what's due. The liquid cannot pay what's due. Mm. <laughs> Colostomy bags filling and emptying a clap tin. Clap tin. <laughs> Liquidation is the word given to the dissolution of assets after bankruptcy. <clears throat> An insolvent loses its form in liquid, dissolving, fizzing up like vitamin C, and becoming it. Mm. Becoming liquid is the opposite of having a voice. Mm. But liquid cannot pay what's due. <clears throat> The fear of contamination by liquid runs strong here. An eel with toxic shock from the brine pool at the bottom of the sea is knotting itself into a figure eight. Mm. Infected liquid is oozing out of my eczema holes. I can't go barefoot near swimming pools or wet floors in case I step on a floating plaster or some other foreign body. I've got too too much much histamine. histamine. I've got too much histamine. There's There's a a practice of removing tiles from the roofs of terrace housing so that the rain can come in, causing them to rot from the inside out and forcing dereliction. A boarded up house is like a taxidermy rabbit, insides hollowed out, the dead exterior left in place to act out the idea of itself until it's knocked down. Some children shot me with a water Mm. gun outside the last house Mm. left on a derelict street. Mm. The plastic Mm. gun in my Mm. face caused water to drip down my nose, hitting the camera that I was using Mm. to film the empty houses before realising there was still a family living there. Mm. And And then there was was the the knotweed that spread spread its roots under under my house, splitting the pipes and throwing liquid body out of the drains and down the street an out of body body disposal the neighbours stood in their driveways watching it flow past them while I swept it into plastic bags using a dustpan and brush Mm. I used to eat the wallpaper particularly that wallpaper that had an unpleasant chalky texture and so many years of pain that it cut the roof of my mouth and stuck in my teeth until they bled. Nothing could get in past this. Mm. Eating the wallpaper collapses the sharp lines. People are wearing spikes resembling anti-homeless architecture on their trainers. Mosquitoes have the first two. They extract from the bodies Mm. they land upon, taking with them little bits of their host's Mm. consciousness. And in certain cases, their voices. Mosquitoes ventriloquise their enemies like sparrows singing the sound of the soul. Apart from the efficiency of this collective body theft, mosquitoes do not contribute to the ecosystem, and if wiped out, no harm would be done. Pushing the voice to breaking point collapses the sharp lines. In therapy, when the voice breaks, something else can come through the holes, something liquid, like infected eczema or sparrows singing the sound of a saw. A speaking mm. cure. An eel knots. Mm. People are wearing spikes resembling anti-homeless architecture on their trainers. Out-of-body body body disposals are swept into into plastic plastic bags bags with a dustpan and brush. You told me. Rhythm is a coping strategy. You told me. Percussion stabilises intrusive thoughts. Mm. You told me. Sensory Mm. displacement is enacted through abstract violence. A fur coat was put around me to protect me from the cold caused by the brick through the window. Now it's hung outside the front door. 
Skin on skin. <clears throat> Thanks so much for listening. Bye. Um, I'm back. Yeah, sorry. Are you on back? <laughs> No worries. I just wrote a message to everyone that was meant for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your lecture. Um, I did actually, some of you might remember, in some of the students might remember, at the very first session um, of the term, I did recommend you go and check out Rebecca's uh, exhibition, which was at Matt's Gallery in, in Dilston Galleries in Southern Park. Um, I checked it out a few weeks ago. I thought it was brilliant. And I think it was the first time that I'd experienced one of your works kind of in the flesh. Um, so yeah, that was amazing. I didn't make it to the performance, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for being here and thanks so much for your lecture. Um, I know that you thought that you had to kind of condense it down into 45 minutes, which is why it was that length. But we've got, you know, we've got a bit more time now. so. We can take any questions and if you wanted to show any other works um, or play any other tracks, we could also um, go through those. Um, do we have any students um, with any questions this week? Maybe students first and then if not any guests are also welcome. Anyone? You can put up your hand. Alex, go ahead. Hi, uh, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, I have a question about um, your your voice specifically um, and accent. Um, you use your speaking voice a lot in your work. Um, and as somebody who's also from Manchester or near Manchester, I've often been insecure about using my own voice in my work for some reason. Um, I don't know why, um, but I just wondered if that's something you've experienced and how you go about that. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, it took me a, a long time to be able to use my voice in my work. Um, at first, I was really just in general, I was nervous about it. And um, I think I just started to become more comfortable, but but generally, you know, when you work with voice and you're working kind of, you know, reading into the computer, reading into microphones or reading directly into a sound program, I feel like you can kind of play around with, with your voice. And a lot of the time things don't quite sound right and I have to redo them and I have to redo them again. Um, in, terms, in terms of accent, I think, it's absurd that anyone feels that way, um, but I totally understand that you that you do. So I totally encourage you to just own that. That's yeah, that's nice to hear. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. accents are beautiful, aren't they? I mean, it seems um, a shame that anyone feels that way. Yeah, I have a few students like in fine art, kind of also kind of yeah contending with similar issues but also like kind of more broadly around like kind of class in the art world and mm. um that kind of feeling out of place or of having a regional accent and being made to feel out of place or kind of patronized um i think anna's got a question oh we've got loads of questions coming okay let's take anna's first and then we'll go to the ones in the chat go ahead anna so it's Risha, isn't it Isha, yes. Hi, I really enjoyed that, especially uh, the um, oh, all of the um, harmo little harmonies and rhythms, and that's uh, what my question is about. Do you uh, intentionally um, uh, uh, compose uh, your uh, pieces to have those harmonies and uh, special intervals in between uh, the hums and voices and and, and the rhythms. Uh, how, how do you go uh, about it in terms of more the, the music theory? Uh, yeah. Oh, I'd completely bypass any kind of music theory. Um, <laughs> I've, I've not studied um, music or sound. 
uh, for that matter. So I come at it from quite a, um, yeah, kind of making it up as I go along perspective. Um, I sort of, like I said, I started working with rhythms uh, in video editing. I started working with the drums first, um, where I would use kind of percussion, actual percussion to structure the film. And then I realized that it was a lot more interesting, the stuff that I was cutting out of the edit. So I started using kind of ticks and vocal sounds like throat clearing sounds and things like that to structure the edit. And then that built up to um, how can I work with different harmonies and sounds that, that occupy a kind of subjective and psychological space. So I definitely don't come from a kind of, I'm coming a little bit um, from a skewed perspective, really. So it comes, it just comes uh, naturally for you. And that's, that's amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I feel like it's quite, um, when, when, yeah, uh, I always feel anyway that whenever there's, there's a real kind of music person present, my work doesn't sound very musical <laughs> to them. Um, but that's probably my, my paranoia book. Uh, but it, it was very musical for me, so yeah. Oh, thank you. That's great to hear. Yeah, I find your works really musical and I also find like the video editing really rhythmical and it's interesting to hear that that's kind of where it emerged from, like through the video practice and mm -hmm. it feels kind of both the sound and the image are kind of mutually punctuating one another especially in your later works like there's a real there's a real sense that there's a lot of attention that goes into the interplay between the the sound and the image and yeah and I, I agree with with Risha that um I think they are I think they're really musical I mean um but it sounds like you have quite an intuitive approach to kind of creating that musicality what we would mm. some of us perhaps would call but maybe not maybe you talk to musicologists and music theorists who disagree <laughs> Um, any other questions from the floor else? Let's start with the ones in the chat. So perhaps I'll just read them out in case anyone can't see the chat. So Tom says, how did the theme of dereliction become prevalent in your work? And was this affected by your move from Manchester to London? Yeah, uh, yeah, well, um, I've been kind of obsessed with housing for quite a long time. And there's, uh, there's a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of my writing keeps coming back to this theme of housing and dereliction and kind of landlord tenant, um, the, the kind of absurdity of the housing system in this country. And I think that obsession started because I was living in Liverpool um, and I was there when, um, and actually in the film that I showed uh, right at the beginning of the lecture, uh, there are the terrace houses that had been um, boarded up in Liverpool and um, I yeah I specifically be became kind of interested in a lot of the activism surrounding uh, trying to um, maintain communities in in these spaces that were being uh, eroded and these communities that were breaking down in in Liverpool during the two well during and just slightly before the 2008 capital of culture so that was where it started and then it grew when I was in London and kind of, you know, obviously when you live in London, you often live in, in precarious contexts. So um, living in guardian housing and living in kind of different, um, different situations uh, has made me really, yeah, occupied with, with the theme of housing and dereliction. But then also dereliction started to take on kind of other meanings. So you know, uh, the, the idea of, um, of kind of a, a breakdown generally, how can the, the voice be derelicted or how can language be derelicted? Thanks, that's really interesting. Hope that's answered your question. So you'd say it was more about the experience in Liverpool and then to London rather than your home of Manchester, I guess Tom is also asking. Yeah, no, not really Manchester, more um, 
yeah I mean I guess you know it relates to it relates to a lot of places doesn't it but specifically yeah it became a, an obsession in since I left home I left home a long time ago I left home when I was 19 so mm -hmm. yeah thank you okay next question is from Simon you mentioned neurodivergence in relation to approaches in your work. Do you personally identify as neurodivergent? Um, yes, yeah. Um, I, uh, um, I can't really help but identify as <laughs> neurodivergent. Um, I was watching myself actually on the, on the video and I was thinking, oh God, like the way that I uh, move is particularly neurodivergent. But, um, but yeah, no, I do and I think, Again, that's something that I've allowed into my practice more and more. Something that like the accent thing or like being kind of um, being more honest about who you are. Um, it's something that was always edited out and I've started to center it. And I think that's, you know, quite an empowering thing to do. You know, all the kind of all the, 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 the strange sounds that you make that you always try to edit out become part of your practice. And that's I find that quite empowering. Thank you for that answer. Um, okay, Tanya, great, all the questions, keep them coming in. Tanya, I am curious about how intertwined voice and image are in your installations, as I was saying before. When you work, does one, does one come before the other? Is the, is the process intertwined too, e.g. how you explain to the carp? Yeah, that, I mean, that's really, uh, th actually, that's really integral. Uh, and I always forget it like that. It's not it's not totally clear which comes first, because normally I imagine that my practice, uh, my practice is based around writing, but writing is always based around images. Like I don't really write in a literary way. I kind of write in a stream of images. Normally an image comes first. Um, so, yeah, I think. I think possibly imagery comes first possibly but but then like you say there's a kind of uh they they both occupy a really similar space in the work so yeah but then the the, the kind of the image of the sound as well <laughs> so um yeah yeah, it's a, I don't really know the answer to that. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to think about it more. Um, OK, I mean, uh, I don't know if anyone else has asked this, but maybe it's a good point. Just I was curious about your um, your kind of trajectory in your art practice, because you kind of talked about how you got really interested in, in using sound and working with it in a multi-channel way especially with the voice and spatializing it. Um, but what was your practice like before? And yeah, maybe that helps to unlock that you, you think of yourself primarily as writing text, but then there's texts really like full of images mm. at the same time as you're also kind of experiencing them, I guess, as sounds, as words at the same time. Mm like what was my trajectory through practice yeah mm. i think i was actually thinking about this before um because when i went to the slade in 2010 i got i think now i realize i got a bit lost um and i lost um i kind of lost the joy i think i lost the kind of the joy of practice um and I became very, you know, I can get quite obsessive within my practice. And I got very obsessed with what does, what does the work mean, which would often reduce and reduce and reduce it. So I was actually doing quite, at that time, quite conceptual, sort of quite minimal work, really. Um, and I started writing texts um, as that I, I wanted to make performance, but every time I would end up writing a script for a performance and then I started exhibiting the texts. Um, so that kind of, I think that was the trajectory that led me to what I'm now doing um, was a kind of, was an interest in using text in some way visually. Uh, 
but then that became audio. So I did a lot of kind of text um, pieces that were kind of hung, that were like 2D or kind of, or also um, distributed via tote bags or um, on um, kind of, I, I liked this idea of uh, that the text itself performs in some way, invasively, for example. But yeah, so then that became what I'm doing now, but I've always done video. Like I actually was, I've been doing video since, um, I used to do 16 millimeter film uh, when I was at, in Sheffield at university. So that was, um, you know, so that, that was probably a, one of my earliest practices, but there wasn't really a sonic element to it. So maybe those two things kind of collided. Mm, thanks, that's fascinating. Uh, okay, Maria has a question. Do you record your vocals in stereo with two mics or do you record them in mono and pan them afterwards? <clears throat> yeah, I uh, record them in mono, but um, so the, the way I do it at the moment, which I, which I want to, I want to play around with actually recording them spatially um, with two or even more mics. But, um, but at the moment, yeah, I just record several mono recordings and then layer them and then kind of by getting for example in my studio having I've got I managed to get some speakers some Genelec six Genelec speakers that I can play around with in my studio so I kind of play around with how they relate to each other and kind of you know either using Reaper or Ableton I send the different mono channels to each speaker which I think is a really long-winded way of, of doing, doing it, really. I do want to start kind of playing around with other methods, definitely. Sounds like a fine way of doing it to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think some of the students will be a bit familiar or wanting to do some multi-channel works, because I think I know that the studio at LCC has, um, yeah, multi-channel uh, capacities. Mm. Um, Okay, um, thanks. Alicia has a question. You said that studying made you fixated on the concept and certain aspects of your work. Do you think that the process of conceptualizing art may kill the creativity? I think it's different for, for each person. I wouldn't want to make a big statement on what art is really, but I just found for me, what, what I realized is that um, uh, I was losing the joy because I was I was worrying too much about having some kind of perfect meaning or sort of perfect um, delivery of, or, or, of meaning. Um, and, uh, and, and it's not really what my practice has ever been about. Um, so I, I got to a certain point where I just felt a lot more freedom being able to play. And also not knowing, like I do think it's important to not totally understand what you're doing uh, because it kind of means that there's part of it that is a, it's an inquiry. It's, it's something that's being worked out as you go along. So yeah, I don't know. I found that really liberating anyway, personally. Mm. Yeah, I think you've kind of spoken quite a lot about that process of also like, I guess, developing your practice over quite a long time and realizing which bits you were previously perhaps editing out or then you mm. later came to find more interesting or worthy of kind of spending time with or devoting attention to. Mm. Um, Great. Alisa says that's very relatable. Um, I was going to ask, yeah, just because you mentioned, I mean, this kind of draws on Tom's question a bit about um, dereliction, but you also mentioned kind of structures of violence in your work. And I guess that also appears as a motif, as you also said, through these images of dereliction but that you've really broadened that idea, like you were saying, like dereliction in the voice. And you, there's a part in that text where you mention the break in the voice during therapy as, you know, something kind of a significant um, 
or indicative of a kind of deeper fissure or issue within someone's psyche. Um, you mentioned landlords and tenancy and housing as a big theme. Um, I guess I, I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about those, that, like the role of these like violent structures in your work, given that, you know, the works themselves are pretty beautiful. I find them, you know, visually, you know, they're, they're so beautifully shot. And then I think like visually um, with the images and then the sounds, are also very musical and quite lulling so there could be people who experience your work and don't feel or see that violence mm. um so i was wondering how you relate to that idea mm. um i sorry talking of violence my cats are fighting behind me at the moment um yeah uh i mean I think, I don't know whether I said this in the lecture, but I kind of, something that interests me is passively violent structures. So, you know, kind of the, the notion of the landlord as a passive um, violent structure or the kind of, the, the things that are used to protect a territory that become passively violent. So, um, I, think, I think that interests me more than violence in itself like that you know that I don't think I'm dealing with direct um directly with I mean it is violence but the the kind of passivity of that is important to me um yeah I don't know I don't I don't feel like um I feel like most people who go to see my work that seem to comment on how like uh, unnerving it is like I, I don't know it, it might uh, be slightly different watching on a screen I don't know but I think um, I hope anyway that that comes through that that's not lost in a kind of uh, production or exhibition value uh, because I think that is that is important to me that the it's not um, it's that there's a it's not beautiful that there is a passive violence to it and that, that these kind of translations of different forms of different flows but it's not just violent um i guess i kind of often like work with with ideas that that are kind of paradoxes um there's not like one way of looking at it like the mosquitoes or like um uh or the landlord yeah i mean yeah i would add to that that it's not yeah they're not kind of straightforwardly beautiful i guess there's a beauty mm. in the uneasiness that is caused mm. like both in the installation works and in that um setting that you described of the live performance with the voice and the kind of distance and the disjuncture between the live and recorded voice mm. and the almost kind of um dissociative um kind of ex effect of mm. hearing the voice live and recorded at the same time in these like multi-layered ways so mm. i think that definitely does come through mm. um okay we've got a question from derek what's your process of writing your scripts is it a free form process or based on the contextualization of the piece um I've, it's probably worth saying that I actually find writing really difficult. Like I, um, I think writing, um, like comes back to this question of image or text or kind of image and text or, or image and voice. Um, I find it much easier. Basically how I normally start is I write a list of images normally. Um, and then, and then I kind of work work them out into into text so they're kind of like really basic list um you know almost like a like a textual storyboard um i don't uh and then and then sometimes writing just comes you know you just start writing and it just comes but then a lot of the time it doesn't it's i find it a very sort of 
strange practice and that you end up putting too much pressure on it and it's kind of slightly mystical you're like oh is it going to come um so I think yeah I think um I, de I definitely don't kind of think right I'm going to sit down and write today it's uh, it kind of comes through the back door a bit Okay, I hope that's answered your question, Derek. Any other questions? Anyone want to come on the microphone? Ask Rebecca anything? Or in the chat? <clears throat> Derek says thank you. Um, yeah. I guess it it does work quite um or the works do function in a kind of multi-layered way on me at least and then even like the associations between like liquid and the physical liquid and then the, the narration about the kind of um uh, explosion I don't know if that was called through the knotweed but the kind of pouring of the water down the street and um mm. but then the connection to kind of liquidation and financial assets and that you're you're kind of um drawing these quite broad mm. associations that are that kind of function at a bit of a um almost like not subliminal level but you know a kind of um multi-pointed way it's not kind of like a concrete statement or argument you're making it's it's kind of a more nebulous um are you okay are the cats fine all right could just one second <laughs> sorry i did a cat dilemma sorry no worries <laughs> um yeah i don't know if you're able to um get any of my rambles but just I guess these different um, associations that I draw let's say experiencing your work mm. and yeah whether that reflects your process when you're making them whether it is that nebulous and kind of um, kind of multifarious and like complex rather than yeah setting out to achieve something in a concrete sense yeah yeah I think um, like I think destabilization is quite a big part of it because you know when when things kind of constantly shift, there is this constant destabilization of of what you think the narrative is, and um, and and yeah, like I, I think kind of creating these links between different fragments of narrative is something that is just integral to my practice, and yeah. some of them some of them are true. Like I said, the the interest with um, the kind of the, the story or the the narrative fragment about the um, child who shot me with a water gun um, outside the last house left on a derelict street that was that was in Liverpool and that happened to me and and it became really like I mean he he squirted water in my face and that like that just stuck with me as a really poetic and poignant gesture. Um, and then the other one about the knotweed going into the house, that's, that was my, that knotweed went into my dad's house. And that actually happened where kind of feces like spilled out of the house and down the street. Um, so I, I'm kind of, I feel like I'm always con unconsciously collecting these images that then get compiled and brought together in different configurations. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And then I actually wanted to ask you, um, well, a couple of things, but firstly, just because I know that you're a massive fan of The Fall and Mark E. Smith. <laughs> and I was wondering if that was, yeah, if, the, if you ever articulated that as an influence on your work, especially your kind of, I guess, that observation in your language and also, I guess, tapping into that. Yeah, maybe violence isn't the right word, but at least the roughness or the, um, yeah ugliness of bits of life around us all 
Mm. Yeah, I mean, um, it sounds like I always, uh, I'm always very conscious that it sounds like a massive cliche. So I don't really, <laughs> I don't really bring it up. But yeah, <laughs> I probably have, I have, probably have been very influenced by, by Marky Smith. Um, but I, I think also that kind of like um, the sort of relentless de- like production interests me where it's just put it out keep putting it out keep putting it out doesn't matter if it is the same as the last thing you know just keep doing it um and through that you get to something really uh I don't know you get something really joyful um and you're not thinking you know like I I brought up about the way I felt when I was at the Slade I was thinking a lot about what people were reading into my work or what people were thinking of my work and I think this what appeals about that kind of um process is just putting it out and not worrying too much about what's going to become of it and so I just think I work a bit more like that now Hmm. but yeah Mm -hmm. I'm influenced by loads of like music has massively influenced me Hmm. as well as you know performance and and kind of uh sound Mm -hmm. Stephen says repetition is discipline. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I also wanted to ask you if this isn't too horrible a question, just about your PhD work that you're you started, I think, fairly recently, or maybe it was during the pandemic. Um, but I know that the project is around the voice and includes your art practice, but that's pretty much all I know. Yeah. I if you want to talk about that. So it's, I'm currently on pause um, and kind of working out exactly what to do, uh, but I won't go into that too much. But um, uh, but yeah, the idea, the ideas kind of in the research on my PhD were about kind of how um, how we inhabit voices um, and how voices inhabit us, and how that's influenced by the sociopolitics of a certain, uh, um, for example, housing conditions. So how, for example, you relate to others' voices depending on how thin your walls are or how precarious your context is. Um, I'm always thinking about how, um, or trying to get closer to this question of how the kind of senses of collectivity exist within the individual, how we relate to other voices and um, how they kind of exist within us. So that that was the the kind of starting point of the PhD, looking at kind of specifically housing and precarious housing and the impact that has on our relationship to voice. So I'm hoping Mm -hmm. I can pursue that again, but it's on pause at the moment. I mean, there's that famous study, isn't there? I think it's actually based in Liverpool of, um, I can't remember the, I think it was a sociologist who studied a kind of um, community of people living in terraced houses and the audibility and kind of interviewed them all about Mm. how much they hear their neighbours and how it actually kind of helped create a sense of community rather than, you know, Mm. often people think, oh, that's an awful thing. like that's just noise that's just disturbance but Mm. a lot of people actually spoke really positively about it Mm. um of kind of yeah you know you kind of know what your neighbors are up to but it's not it's not an intrusion it's just a feeling of community yeah I mean not everyone but I think that was that was like a lot of the findings yeah 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 that really interests me um okay Maria has asked a question um do you have a favorite writer or any poets inspiring you? Uh, A favourite writer. Um, Oh, God, I thought about I thought the question was going to be what's my who's my favourite artist? I was like, Oh, God, who's my favourite artist? (laughs) It's always really difficult, this question. Um, Yeah, I'm just looking at my bookshelves. I mean, you know, this is another cliche, but I really liked um, Argonauts by Maggie Nelson. Um, I thought that was just an absolutely beautiful book. Um, I mean, it, in terms of her writing style, it has nothing to do with mine, but um, I really engaged with that book. Um, uh, writers, in terms of novels, I tend to, 
I'm, I tend to not read novels very often, actually, which is a weird, um, yeah, which is weird. Poetry I've got into more recently over the last like sort of five, 10 years, but I never was before. Um, uh, um, oh God, let me think about this. Poets. I'm, re I'm reading um, Jen Hodgson, who was in my performance, who I used to live with. We used to live with. Um, she's writing a book about Anne Quinn at the moment. And uh, I've been reading extracts of that um, to feed back to her. And it's amazing. And also just kind of looking at the life of Anne Quinn, who's actually a really interesting um, uh, writer. Um, there's one poem that um, I read recently that I really like, and I'm, I'm worried that I've forgotten her name. Um, it, the, the, um, the poem was called the, oh, oh God. Uh, it, it actually felt really relevant to my work actually. Um, and kind of like, it was called something, the animal shock. The, oh, um, Garments Against Women, who's that? So the book is called Garments Against Women. So I've got a really bad memory. Um, Anne Boyer. So yeah, I read that recently. Um, and the first uh, poem in the book um, is about animal shock. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's an amazing poem. So uh, I can't, I can't think of any more, but there are others. I think that was quite a few. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for sharing those. All right, any more questions from the floor or from the guests? Um, thought we could if no one else has a question, you could choose uh, maybe a track to play us out on. We could end. Um, <clears throat> if you have anything that's about seven minutes long, about or five minutes, minutes long. <laughs> well, I thought because um, I was talking a bit about the idea of rehearsals and, and kind of I was thinking before about remixes. Like in a way, I'm kind of really into this idea of the remix. Like you take something and then you just sort of slightly remix it. So there was the piece that I did for, for the late junction um, and it's called Dumb, but it's got a lot of the same ideas uh, and recycled texts, but it's kind of more of a, a piece for radio. Like I tried, I was like, okay, I need to make a piece for radio. So I'm just gonna take these fragments of things that I've been working on and make them into a piece of radio. So we could end on that if you want. So it's the one yeah. called Dumb. Thanks, brilliant. Is that in the is that you sent to Michael before? Yeah, yeah. Or the or the other one is the mouths piece, but we I did play some of that, so maybe it's better to play something different. Just find the link. Thanks, Michael. I can't find it myself. Too many emails have just come in. Uh... Some amazing questions, like best uh, questions I've had in an artist lecture for ages. <laughs> <laughs> Normally it's just complete silence. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks everyone. Which, which link was it, sorry? Uh, the one called Dumb. Well, dumb, yeah, yeah, on SoundCloud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, this is why I recorded it professionally because this is the quality of the screen that I've got on my computer. <laughs> oh, it's not that bad. <laughs> oh, well. Um, brilliant. 
Okay, so yeah, thank you so much for joining us, Rebecca, and thank you so much for your lecture. And thank I guess you for we can listen to this uh, on our way out. Um, and yeah, see the rest of you in two weeks' time for our lecture by Anka Eckhart. Cheers, everyone. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Thank you. Yeah, I'm mute myself. much Rebecca. Rebecca thanks everyone thank you then, yeah take care and yeah unless the truck get called gets called off um yeah we'll, if it does then we'll see you next Thursday but most likely see you in two weeks take care everyone bye bye